I'm Holly Mitchell. I'm the founder of the Leadwell Network, and I'll be your leadership coach today. We're going to talk today about emotional intelligence, and this is one of my favorite topics because for me personally, it's been a journey to learn more about my emotions and how to manage them. When I was growing up, I really struggled a lot with anxiety. And in the beginning, I thought, this is just who I am. And I felt very victimized by it and didn't know that it was possible to change it and learn how to deal with it in a different way. When I got older, I, I really took the approach of wanting to master my emotions. I want to control this anxiety. I will defeat you, anxiety. And, um, and then when I got introduced to the idea of emotional intelligence, I realized that I could develop a curiosity for my anxiety and find out that it's actually trying to tell me something about myself. Maybe there's a part of me that still needs to heal. Maybe there's a part of me that still needs to grow. And so when you start to have a different relationship with your emotions and you become curious about them and observe them, you can have a better management of them. And emotional intelligence isn't just about managing yourself, but it's also managing the relationships of the people in your life, both personally and professionally. When you can develop these skills, you're going to see tremendous results. You'll become way more effective in your personal and professional relationships. People with IQ, with IQ tend to have a fixed um, IQ their whole life, but EQ can really be developed, it can be trained. And 90% of high performers have high EQ, so it's a really, really valuable skill. It's actually the single biggest predictor of leadership success. Those with high EQ, store, EQ scores actually make an average of $29,000 more per year than those with lower EQ scores. So it can be very valuable for you personally and financially. Now there are four key skills of emotional intelligence and the first, has to do, first two have to do with yourself and then the next two have to deal with your relationships. So the first skill is self-awareness and then self-management. The next is social awareness and relationship management. So let's talk about self-awareness. So think about your emotions as habits. They're, um, they're stories about you. You can have a trigger and you can have an anchor. So triggers are things that you know when you're being triggered, right? You're, you're experiencing your emotions physically. Your heart might start pounding, you might start sweating, your voice might get higher or you you're start to shout, you might get really upset. And these are just habits that are happening in your body because things that happen in your life create an imprint in your emotional body, which tell you that you're not safe. And maybe, you're, maybe you have a fear of public speaking. Maybe something happened to you when you were seven years old and the teacher called you up to answer a question in front of the whole class and you got it wrong. And you remember the teacher shaking her head and frowning and the, the class laughing at you. And what happens there is it imprints in your emotional memory and it creates a trigger. So anything that feels familiar to your body that reminds you of that moment is going to create an emotional response in you. So triggers are more negative emotional responses, but you can also have anchors, things that you associate with positive emotions. So for me, I think about the smell of beer. <laughs> the smell of beer for me is actually a really positive smell. I remember when my father came home every night and he worked in the prison, so he actually went to jail every single day. And that's a really stressful environment to have to deal with every day. So before he'd come into our house and join the family, he'd sit out on the porch and he'd drink a beer. And I remember being tucked in every night by my dad, the smell of beer in his beard. And so whenever I smell those hops and that smell of beer, it reminds my body, it's time to go to sleep. <laughs> And I actually find it really relaxing. So I have a positive anchor of that association. So when you start to develop your self-awareness, you'll notice the things that trigger you. You'll notice the things that um, create positive associations with you. So you can start to use these as strategies and observe yourself and learn and ask yourself, why am I feeling this way? Why does this situation trigger me? Or, or why do I have a positive association? And you can observe what creates those emotions in your body. It's important not to do it from a place of judgment. 
So in the beginning when I started to develop my self-awareness, um, I felt very critical when the emotional response wasn't what I wanted it to be. And instead of being a critic, you really want to be more like an observer and a coach. This is going to help you move on to self-management and become more effective in the emotional response that you choose. So when we're thinking about self-management, what does that really mean? Self-management is the ability to use that awareness, that self-awareness to stay flexible and make different choices, direct that behavior positively. You want to you think about the response that's going to be the most effective for you. So in Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he talks about a stimulus. And so you know when there's a stimulus when you're feeling that emotional response. And then that response usually happens automatically. But if you can slow that process down, what happens in the middle is a choice. So let's say you're at work and a coworker eats your sandwich that you put in the fridge. If you remember that episode from Friends when Ross had that, that special Thanksgiving sandwich that he put in the fridge and one of his coworkers ate it and he just lost his mind, right? And he, he got disciplined at work because he went ballistic. So that was the response that he chose. But you actually can make space for yourself to choose a healthy response. So one unhealthy way of expressing that emotion would be to be like Ross and friends and to be overly dramatic and maybe send a nasty email or try to find out who that culprit was and go after them. What would be a more effective response? So maybe you, could, maybe you do find out who ate your sandwich and you could ask them, hey, what happened? Um, did you notice that I, I wrote my name on the sandwich? Uh, maybe that person was really hungry. Maybe they had low blood sugar or they didn't um, have enough money to buy their own lunch and, and so they ate whatever was available. Uh, you never really know unless you ask. So choosing an appropriate response that's going to help you be effective for managing yourself and your relationships is that's when you can really take those emotional intelligence skills to the next level. So think about what's going to be a proactive response that's going to get you a good result and a reactive response, which is usually that first automatic response. That's our limbic lizard brain um, wanting to get even or wanting to make you safe. And it's totally normal to have those, those responses, but giving ourselves a moment to manage ourselves. So what are those strategies? How do you make that space for yourself to give yourself more options, more flexibility, more choices? So the first thing to do is to breathe. Take a second, pause, process. What, what are all of my options? What are all the different choices I can make right now? And what would happen if I choose those various responses? The other thing that can really help you be more emotionally resourceful is having a self-care routine. So for me, those morning rituals, what I do in the morning, really sets me up to have a positive day. So if I'm not well rested or I haven't had my breakfast, hanger is a scientific fact, okay? So you want to set yourself up for success. How you take care of your body is going to give you more access to your resources to choose more proactive responses and better manage your emotions. So think about what you really want to get out of the responses that you choose. How can I best serve this relationship? How can I best serve myself? And plan out your responses. So sometimes if something happens, you might need to take a moment, take a break to really reflect and choose and improve that self-talk. So as you're coaching yourself to and observing yourself to be more effective and develop new habits that are going to serve you better, remember positive self-talk. There's a really, really great book by Shad Helmstetter called What to Say When You Talk to Yourself. And it's proven that when you speak to yourself in a positive way, it's going to get better results over a shorter amount of time than to constantly be berating yourself. It really doesn't help you change those habits in any way. And focus on the things that are in your control. So sometimes the things that trigger us are external forces that we don't have any control over. So maybe you uh, there was a sick passenger on the train and you showed up late for work and that really stressed you out and you're really mad about it or the weather is crappy today or you had something that happened at home that that might be weighing on you and affecting your professional um, attitude today 
find a way to make some space for yourself to reset, to take a pause, to breathe, have a sip of water, have a cup of coffee, whatever you need to do to find that centered place where you have more access to your resources. That's really what self-management is all about. So another reason to improve your self-management of your emotions is it's gonna help you live longer. Stress is bad for your health and cortisol is really gonna interfere with your immune system, with your digestion, with your reproductive systems and your growth systems. Anxiety, depression, and weight gain are all related to long-term exposure from cortisol. So if you're in control of those emotions and you're choosing better responses, you're actually reducing headaches, you're reducing your risk of heart disease and sleep apnea, digestive issues, memory, and concentration impairment. Those are all related to your stress level. So now let's talk about how emotional intelligence shows up when you're dealing with other people. So just as you become more aware of yourself, you also want to develop your social awareness skills, how you become aware of what other people are experiencing and becoming curious about their responses. Learning how to actively listen was one of the most powerful skills in my leadership development. I remember in the beginning when I listened, I often waited to share my own stories. So if someone was sharing a story of their own, I wanted to respond with something of mine that was similar. And sometimes that's helpful and sometimes it's not and can create a disconnect if that person is really looking to be heard. Often when I was listening, I wanted to find ways to give people advice because I felt like that's what they wanted. But in actuality, that's not always the case. Sometimes they just want to share. They're, they're not really looking for your opinion. And you can ask them, are you looking for my advice or do you just want me to be an ear for you? And that really helps strengthen those relationships. So here's some things that you can do to improve your social awareness. One is getting really good at using people's names. Dale Carnegie said that the sweetest sound in the whole world is a person's name. And when you can use those names, you can connect with people more easily. And watch their body language and their tone of voice. Notice when they get uncomfortable when they're with you and become curious about why that is. Be present, develop those listening skills. And when you have to have difficult or crucial conversations, remember that timing is everything. So search for that right time and tone to have difficult conversations so that you're investing in the relationship and building that foundation for trust. And always put yourself in their shoes. I learned this phrase from author Isabel Wilkerson about radical empathy. So radical empathy is not what would I do if I were you? It's what do you do based on what you have endured. Everyone has a story. Everyone has different triggers. Everyone has different anchors. And when we can become curious about what other people experience, how their minds work, how their emotions respond, we can become more effective in the choices that we make when we're dealing with them. So now let's talk about relationship management. This is the ability to use that social awareness, that information that you've gathered to choose effective uh, reactions, effective responses when you're dealing with them. And that's really a product of that quality time and that observation and the depth of connection that you've spent with that person. Relationship management allows you to have more influence that's what great leadership is. It's not being able to have power or significance. It's really about being able to connect, to communicate, and to have an impact on people from a place of influence. Just as you've become curious about yourself, you become curious of other people. And curiosity, even when emotions are high, is a really, really important skill to develop. Because when you become frustrated, other people perceive that as judgment. And when they feel like you're judging them, you have absolutely no influence in them whatsoever. They're not going to hear you anymore. So establishing that safety, that curiosity about their experiences and why they get upset when they get upset. Asking them what they want. Just as you ask yourself, what are you trying to get when you're feeling stressed out? Remember that emotional bank account. 
this is a really great emotional emotional intelligence strategy is are you investing in the bank accounts of the relationships with the people who are important to you think about deposits are you speaking their love language are you having those crucial conversations those meaningful conversations to connect and remember when they need to have crucial conversations with you to give and take that feedback really well always acknowledging their feelings as well as your own. Because when you care, it shows. When you care about what their experience is, you can be more influential. And whenever you have to make decisions, explain the why behind them. Don't just make them. And whenever you're giving feedback, make it kind, clear, and constructive. So it's an, it's an emotional journey, right? Learning those intelligence skills it's starting from the habits that we have, that were given to us by our stories, our experiences, the people that we've interacted with, knowing whether they serve us. So if a habit is serving you, maybe you have a fear of dogs. I don't know why that would serve you. I love dogs, but maybe it serves you. Maybe it's protecting you in some way and you don't want to change it and that's okay. But if you realize you do want to change it, you can start to practice new strategies. So. Thinking about um, that self-awareness, that self-management, social awareness, and those relationship management will really help strengthen you in your leadership skills and make you more influential and effective.